All right, this is our second lecture on the life of David. David has been established as king and has been doing a good job ruling as king. One of the things he did was he made peace with the Benjamites um, by actually taking Jonathan's son Mephibosheth into his house and taking care of him by uh, burying the body of or the head actually of Ishbosheth that was brought to him and uh, he has united the country under his leadership tragically David while he was a very godly man has a bad episode in his life that we want to talk about the army is out in battle actually against the Ammonites David, instead of going out and leading the army, which was traditionally what the kings would do, is staying at home, and the army is under the leadership of Joab. And David looks out from the roof of his palace, and he sees a lady that uh, probably is not dressed well, probably has no idea that anybody can see her. Uh, we don't know. But anyway, he calls for Bathsheba to come, and he and Bathsheba commit adultery. The next thing we know is that she notifies David that I am expecting a child. My husband Uriah has been out at the battlefront. So, you know, I've got a problem. So David calls for Uriah to come. Ask him how things are going in the army. Uriah, however, refuses to go home and instead sleeps out on the doorstep of David. And... Uh, then David will send him back with a message to Joab to have Uriah killed in battle. So not only does David commit adultery with Bathsheba, he will also commit adultery with her husband, uh, commit murder with her husband Uriah. And uh, then after Uriah is dead, David will marry Bathsheba. The uh, baby that is born. Um, however, the prophet Nathan comes and tells David that God is going to punish you for what you have done. Now, David probably thinks that everything is secret and everything is hidden, and yet I would suspect that everybody in the capital city knew about exactly what happened. Joab knows, he's had servants have known, and I'm sure that it is fairly public information. Nathan knows about it. He gives him a parable about a man who stole somebody's pet lamb and killed him and ate the, ate the lamb and David is furious and says that man will die and Uriah said or Nathan the prophet said you are the man thou art the man God decides to spare David's life but as a result of David's sin David and Bathsheba's baby will die however David and Bathsheba will have another son later on which they will name Solomon who will be the king that will follow David. But it seems like that there are problems now in David's family because of his actions. David's son, his oldest son, Amnon, falls in love with his half-sister, Tamar. And he will commit fornication with her. He will rape her. And then he will get angry at her and refuse to marry her, as is commanded in the Old Testament. Tamar's full brother, Absalom, is furious and angry over what happened. He waits for the good for his time, and then he will kill Amnon, and Absalom will then flee the country. David will mourn for Amnon and will mourn for Absalom, Joab will be instrumental in helping to bring Absalom back to the country. But Absalom then will begin a revolt against David. He will stand outside of the palace, smooth-talking everybody that comes, acting like that he will be on their side, and that if he were in charge, he would help them and gradually subverts the hearts of the people of Israel to him versus his father David. 
Absalom is apparently a very good looking young man and uh, the most attractive thing about him is his hair and apparently it's fairly long and fairly uh, fairly beautiful to look at so his, his looks is used and uh, he has a way of words to convince people Absalom will go down to the city of Hebron and there he will have himself anointed as king and then he will march on Jerusalem with an army of men David is completely unprepared and David will flee from Jerusalem and Absalom will march in with his troops now helping Absalom will be David's key advisor a man named Ahithophel Ahithophel happens to be the grandfather of Bathsheba and so you really wonder if something is involved in that causing Ahithophel to switch sides a uh, another man by the name of Hushai uh, is a loyal advisor to David and David sends him back to thwart the plans of Ahithophel if at all possible and another man by the name of Idai who is uh, from Gath he chooses to go and identify himself with David the high priest Abiathar and another priest that works with him Zadok they are both, both loyal to David but David leaves him back in Jerusalem uh, with the Ark of the Covenant and says don't take it with, uh, you, with you but uh, they are used as spies to let David know what is going on in the city Ahithophel's plans is for Absalom to immediately send out soldiers to capture David and to kill him and finish him off Hushai suggests instead that uh, Absalom should work to establish himself as king and he says that David's got some mighty men around him and you know you may have a bigger army but that doesn't mean you're going to defeat him and Hushai's plans are accepted Ahithophel's uh, are not Ahithophel goes home and commits suicide and hangs himself and that is the end of Ahithophel meanwhile while David is fleeing we have a man named Shimei he's a Benjamite and he will mock David uh, and throw stones at him and probably he's a Benjamite that would have been in the hierarchy of uh, Saul's kingdom and he's held uh, some pretty negative feelings for a long time over that the battle comes off David's men will win the battle Israel will be defeated Absalom will be riding underneath a tree and it says he'll be taken up by his head I suspect that actually his hair is probably what gets caught and his animal just keeps on going and he is left there dangling Joab finds out about it and even though David had ordered his people not to do anything to hurt Absalom Joab will kill Absalom and uh, that will be the end of Absalom and uh, with the defeat of Absalom and with victory for David that battle is over but instead of rejoicing in the victory David begins to mourn over the loss of his son Absalom and finally Joab comes to him and says your men are getting very discouraged uh, it sounds like he said you wish that uh, we had all died and Absalom had lived well David was looking at the fact that his son had died and he was not pleased with that Absalom with his passing David again is placed in his king uh, but there is another revolt that follows almost immediately after this and that is the revolt of a man by the name of Sheba because David is angry with Joab he will send out Amasa to gather troops together to go after Sheba Sheba is a Benjamite Sheba feels like this is a time for a good time for a revolt while Israel is still divided Amasa takes too long David will send the troops he has under Abishai Joab will go with those men Joab will meet Amasa and uh, Joab will kill Amasa and then Joab and the troops and his brother Abishai will 
uh, surround the city that uh, Sheba has gone to, the little city of Abel, and uh, proceed to begin to attack the city. And a wise woman will holler out and ask why they're attacking this city. And uh, Joab basically says, "It's not. It's the problem is not the city. It's you have a man by the name of Sheba in there that we want him." And so they will chop off Sheba's head and throw it over the wall, and uh, they will return. David has a group of warriors that we could call David's mighty men. And I'm not going to mention very many of these. It's a, a group of 30 men, 30 mighty men. And it actually gives a list of 37, probably some changed at one time or another. But one of those is a man named Abishai. And Abishai is a tremendous warrior, along with being a general for David as well. He kills one of Goliath's brothers is one of the things that he accomplishes. Another man is Benea. Benea is going to later on be the general under King Solomon. And Benea is uh, quite a personal warrior. Uh, he will go down into a pit and kill a lion. He will go down with a staff and pluck a sword out of a, another man's hand and kill him. So he is quite a personal warrior. And in the list is a man named Uriah. Bathsheba's husband is also one of David's mighty men. So not only does he kill one of his warriors, he kills one of his mighty men in the process. David, another failure David has is he will take a census. Now the Bible doesn't really say it's wrong to take a census. Moses took two of those. But it looks like David is trying to depend upon himself rather than God in this census, and God is opposed to it. But we do find that there are, and there's two different numbers given depending on which we're, whether we're talking about men of valor or not, but we're looking at uh, approximately 1,100,000 men out of the land of Israel and then another 500,000 out of the land of Judah. The prophet will come to David and said, God is going to punish you for this. You can take your choice. You can have three years of famine, three year months of fleeing before your enemies, or three days of a plague. None of them really good options. David chooses the plague. And 70,000 men, 70,000 people will die in Israel as a result of David's action. To stop the plague, David will go to a nearby hillside just across from Jerusalem and uh, he will buy the land of Aaronah, the Jebusite, and uh, he will then offer the oxen that are used to plow the ground and the instruments that are used to plow the ground uh, to burn the oxen and make a sacrifice to God and the plague will be stayed. That land is later on going to be where the temple will be located. One more revolt. David is an old man. David is on his deathbed. And uh, they will try to keep him warm by finding a young maid to marry to him. Can't imagine really that. Can you imagine trying to keep the old king warm and so you go hunt him up a new wife? some young maiden. Her name is Abishag. And she later on plays into the story. And uh, while David is there dying, his son Adonijah decides it's time to take the throne because he would rather be king than Solomon, the man that David has promised is going to be king. And so he's gathered together Joab on his side. And uh, he has... Abiathar, the high priest with him, and they're throwing a coronation party for Adonijah. When Nathan comes in, Nathan the prophet comes in with Bathsheba, and they notify David what is going on. David will immediately call for his uh, the head of his household guard, Benaiah, and uh, will call for, and they will anoint Solomon to be king immediately. And so while they're having their coronation party for Adonijah, 
Solomon is proclaimed king and is marched through the city of Jerusalem. And uh, the people will then flee Adonijah's party. Solomon will be given a choice of what to do to these people. And uh, let's talk about Solomon's reign. David has charged Solomon to do something about Joab. Joab has murdered two people that were innocent, namely Abner and later on um, Amasa. Benaiah is sent out and Joab is executed. Joab, uh, David also charges Solomon to do something about Shimei, the man who mocked David and threw rocks at him when he fled. Solomon will call Shimei and tells him, stay in Jerusalem. That's his punishment. About ten years later, he has some servants flee. He goes down to get them. Solomon hears about it, and Shimei is then put to death. Later, Solomon will, also be, Solomon will also be charged to build the temple. But let me also mention what happens to uh, some of the others involved in the revolt of Adonijah. Abiathar, the high priest, is removed from being the high priest, and Zadok is placed in his position. And then Adonijah, Solomon calls Adonijah and tells him to behave himself, and nothing will happen to him. However, one of the ways in those days in which a person would proclaim themselves king is by taking a previous king's wives. Sort of a strange custom, I suppose, but that's what they did. Adonijah will go into Bathsheba and ask if she would intercede and let him have Abishag as his wife. And uh, Bathsheba goes in and tells David that, uh, tells Solomon that, and Solomon says, he might as well ask for the kingdom as well. And so Adonijah is put to death. And yes, it apparently is some kind of a play that Adonijah is making to try to proclaim himself king. The other charge that David gave Solomon was to build the temple. And uh, Solomon will build a, an, an incredible building. They will spend a number of years building the temple. He will work together with uh, the, Philistine, uh, the Phoenicians under Hiram. They'll bring in cedar wood from Lebanon. They will bring in craftsmen from there. Everything will be uh, assembled off of site so that there's no uh, chiseling or cutting on site. And uh, it will be, uh, the cedar wood will then be overlaid with gold. And you will have a fabulous temple that is built. In the process, Solomon will be praying to God before the temple is built, and God will come to him and ask Solomon what he would like. And Solomon asks for wisdom to know how to rule the people of Israel. And in addition, God will give him great wealth and a long life if he will obey God. As an example of great wisdom, we have uh, the Queen of Sheba hearing about how great Solomon was. And she shows up. And it says that she asked him all kinds of very hard and very difficult questions. And he was able to answer every one of those. I think the reason that Solomon was so wise is it looks like that the alphabet comes from the Israelites. And it looks like Solomon may have been the first person in world history that actually is going to write down books, develop books, uh, put writing together. And uh, shortly after this, or right around this time, the Phoenicians are going to begin spreading it around the Mediterranean. Of course, Solomon is working hand in hand with Hiram. And so his wisdom is probably based upon not only a very high IQ, but the fact that he can go to books and read all of this information. And when the Queen of Sheba comes, he can probably pull a book out of his library and tell her more about her own country than she knows about her own country herself. And uh, she's absolutely shocked with all of his wisdom. 
Solomon, in order to make treaties with other nations around them, they would make a treaty, and then to uh, make the treaty permanent, then the king would marry one of the other king's daughters. And so Solomon is going to end up with 700 wives and 300 concubines. I've jokingly said that uh, the reason that Solomon was so wise is because he had a thousand wives to advise him. And, uh, you know, he didn't dare make a mistake. Could you imagine how much, uh, what, they, what he would hear about from his wives if he had made a mistake? But anyway, to maintain Solomon's household, it is extremely expensive. And it's bankrupting, I maybe I shouldn't say bankrupting the country, but it's taking a phenomenal amount of wealth. And uh, Solomon's wives will turn his heart away from God. That is a tragedy. Later on in Solomon's life, there's going to be a lot of internal problems. So while they're going to have peace with foreign powers, internally there is going to be trouble. When Solomon dies, Solomon's son comes to the throne and his name is Rehoboam. And they come to Rehoboam and they ask Rehoboam if he will go easier on them than his father did. Rehoboam will go and ask advice of the older men and they will tell them if you will give them what they want they will establish you as king and you'll do well. He goes to the younger men, and their, their advice is, if they get by with this, you'll never, they'll never stop asking for things. And so Rehoboam accepts the advice of the younger people. Ten of the tribes of Israel revolt, <coughs> and they will call a man by the name of Jeroboam and make him king. Now, when Solomon backslid, the prophet Ahijah had come to Jeroboam, and had torn his cloak into 12 pieces. He gave 10 of them to Jeroboam and said that God was going to give him 10 of the 12 tribes of Israel. And so we have the country divided at the death of Solomon because of Solomon's policies and then, <coughs> and then the unwise action of his son Rehoboam. <coughs> 